Please note, in this episode we will be discussing issues surrounding drug use. Drugs regulations that came for things like cocaine was post-First World War. Before that, these items could have been in people's homes and they were using them regularly. This is 100 Years, 100 Objects, stories from the collections of Lancaster City Museums. I'm Rachel Roberts, the Collections Registrar for Lancaster City Museums, and today we'll be looking at the stories behind another object from our collections as we celebrate 100 years of our museums. Today's object is very small, with tiny component parts. It was designed to be easily transported by a doctor when visiting patients. Included in it, though, are some substances with big ideas surrounding them that reveal both historical and modern concerns about drugs. Today's object is an ophthalmic case. The case is only 6cm long, 3cm wide and 2cm deep. It fits inside a small purpose-made brown suede bag which has protected it over the years. The metal of the case is silver and still very shiny and untarnished. On the lid are stamped the words tabloid brand ophthalmic case. When you open the lid you can see a range of eight tiny glass vials held into the lid with a metal frame. Each vial has a stopper and carries a detailed label with what is inside. In the bottom half, also held in place with a metal frame which hinges up, is another glass vial, this one used, a tiny brush, an eyedropper and an arrangement of glass stick and cotton wool which would serve as a sort of reusable cotton bud. There are several drugs contained in the vials but there is one word written on many of them that carries a lot of weight in our society and may be surprising to some modern listeners. Cocaine. We spoke to Dr Karen Wright, a senior lecturer at Lancaster University in the Biomedical and Life Sciences Division, part of the Faculty of Health and Medicine. We started by discussing the history of this small case and what it would have been used for. This little case is really, really tiny and was used in essentially GPs who would have been travelling to people's homes in the early 1900s and they would have had this little kit in their bags to use for any ophthalmic or eye conditions that they may have been trying to treat. So there's lots of very, very tiny little ampules in it with lots of different drugs. It also has other aspects to help the doctor use a dropper and so on. But it is quite small and has very tiny amounts of drug in the ampules. Interestingly, there are a couple there that most people would know. Cocaine. So there's little ampules of cocaine hydrochloride um, as a powder. In some of these boxes, you might have found morphine as well. Cocaine and morphine would have been used to numb the eye for any kind of procedure that the doctor would have needed to do on the eye that might have caused pain. There are some other drugs in there that the names of which people might not know of, but they were also, all of them actually have been derived in some form or another from plants. Pilocarpine and physostigmine, which would have been used for the treatment of glaucoma, which reduce the pressure inside the eye. These are powders and they would have been dissolved in water and if it was a hospital setting they would have been able to inject it into an eye if they needed to for the pain relief or so on before surgery or in the home setting they would have used them in a dropper so that you could drop it into the eye. Like cocaine and the other drugs found in this kit, many drugs which we still use today are derived from plants. Karen went on to tell us how important plants are to the production of medicines. Up until that time, really, the only kinds of medicine that we would have had as humans would have been a whole history of understanding what plants were able to do certain things for human beings. For example, the cocaine is a plant, coca plant is in South America, and the indigenous populations would have been using it because it gave them a bit of energy or whatever. So these things have been discovered over millennia, really, and often they'd be used as whole plants. During the 1800s, there was a little bit more of the chemistry of being able to extract some of these components from plants and then to try and understand what some of these components that came out of a plant actually did. So in fact, pretty much all of the things we might have been using would have come from plants. And many people will know that Chinese herbal medicine has a long history of use from plants, tree bark, 
um, from mushrooms, all sorts of things would have been used. There would have been some plants that were toxic, so they would have been used as you know, poisons or sometimes as antidotes to other poisons. So a long history of plant use. And those were, in fact, the only medicines that were available to us. Next, we asked Karen how these drugs work inside our body to have an effect on us and whether we still use these plant-based medicines today. We do. Cocaine is still used clinically, not only as a drug of abuse, but it is also used clinically. And so is morphine used clinically, which is from the opium plant. And we also still use cannabis. There is recreational use of cannabis, but there is also medicinal use of cannabis as well. They're all acting on different things. They're acting on either a receptor, which can bind to them, and that might be in the brain or if it's in the eye that we've just been talking about. And the effect of them might be to relax the muscle of the eye, for example. The opioids, which is the morphine, those can bind to opioid receptors, which are also in our brains and actually also in lots of different parts of our body. Once bound to that receptor, they will then um, send signals, pain relief signals into the central nervous system. Cannabis will also bind to particular receptors and those can affect different parts of our body, such as our heart rate and muscle relaxation, euphoria if um, in high doses. So there are lots of things in our bodies, systems even, that can respond to these components from plants. And what that actually means is that we have our own, what we call endogenous systems. So we don't have those systems in order to respond to the plant. We have those systems because we have our own endogenous compounds that can bind those receptors or activate enzymes that do particular jobs. As it happens that there are a number of plants that have compounds that can also bind to those systems. Understanding how that works and then potentially how one can manipulate that is the way that we can then use those plant extracts for the future. So sometimes it's understanding that this plant extract does do something, but can we modify that in some way to to make it more useful or to make it a cleaner molecule or so on for, for, for medicine use? Today, some of the drugs found in this kit, especially cocaine, carry with them a particular set of beliefs and feelings in the public mind. What societal and historical aspects affect the way that drugs are used and the way that we perceive them? What's interesting is that some of the drugs regulations that came for things like cocaine, opium and also cannabis a little later, in the UK anyway, was post-First World War. Before that, these items could have been in people's homes and they were using them regularly, were able to get them from their local pharmacy without any trouble. And I think that's also, again, coming back to the point that there wasn't anything else. These were the things that people were using um, in cough mixtures and all sorts of things. So the abuse of them, I think, is quite complex. Some of it may be around the fact that post-First World War was the beginning of understanding of what addiction actually was. At the time, that very little understanding of what addiction actually meant and how it's a a central nervous system pathway and understanding addiction was still in its early days at that time. Also, in other countries and um, the UK as well, there was a certain amount of racism attached to it. So, for example, cannabis was regarded as a black American criminal behavior, and therefore that's why it was banned. There was banning of opium around the fact that there were Chinese opium dens. So some of these things were not really very truthful of actually what was going on at the time because they became associated with criminality. Cannabis actually in lots of countries has been also banned as an illegal drug in like 15, 1600s in some Arabic countries. And Essentially, what's happened there is that there's been a real change in the fact that it then becomes back into use and then reclassified and then back into illegal use. And I think some of that is really around attitudes to both addiction and criminality. And some of those things really need to get unpicked so that we can fully understand what these things are doing for humans and therefore how can we make the use of them safer and also um, what clinical use we can have for them. So we still have that legacy 
now, here we are in 2023, and we're still arguing about whether drugs should be legal or illegal or how they're supplied and so on. On the one hand, one might look at the fact that a doctor was walking around with what we now consider to be drugs of abuse. But actually, the key thing about it is that they were in very, very small doses and they were used specifically for the action that they were going to have in the site that we wanted them to have that action. Whereas as they became drugs of abuse, that's much more about dose and the way in which people might then be taking those drugs that then have a much bigger effect and affect other systems systems in the body that then potentially are not beneficial. Karen's current project looks at cannabinoids and how they might be formulated into a range of useful drugs in the future as our understanding of them grows. She began by giving us a better understanding of the background and current uses of cannabis and its components. The use of cannabis has been around for millennia as well. It used to be part of Chinese cultures as well as into the Middle East or what we now call the Middle East. Its use over the years has been around gastrointestinal issues, a little bit of pain, increasing a little bit of appetite. In fact, it was used by Queen Victoria for period pains. It was also used as hemp, so we used to have it where it didn't have the THC in it and it was used to make rope and clothing and so on. The understanding of it really was in the 1960s by Raphael Meshulam in Israel. He was able to identify the two key components of the plant, and those are THC or tetrahydrocannabinol and CBD cannabidiol. And since that time in the 1960s was then really trying to understand what effect did they actually have at a cellular level. So it's taken years really for all of that to be unpicked and we're still, you know, each time we unpick something then there's a whole bunch of new questions. But essentially what has come out of that is that we have our own receptors, we make our own endocannabinoids, they're involved in all sorts of things, particularly around appetite, muscle relaxation, inflammation and the immune response. So that understanding was really coming around 1990s and into the early 2000s and also alongside that was our increased understanding about how THC and CBD were able to also bind and activate the system. So, for example, THC will bind that same receptor and produce a much bigger effect than our own endogenous system would produce. Again, it comes back to that whole idea about dose. CBD doesn't exactly bind the CB1 receptor in the same way, but it can modulate its activity. And really, in terms of medicinal use, the understanding has really been around in certain types of pediatric or childhood epilepsies, able to reduce seizures, and that's because of the way that it acts in the brain. Um, and also pain relief as well, muscle relaxant, so on. So they have medicinal and clinical use. Before she left, Karen let us know where this research might take us in the future. I started out looking at the endocannabinoid system in the gut and how it worked. I also have some interest in whether cannabinoids can have an impact on cancer pathways. I'm not sure how that will translate in the future. More recently, I've got a little bit more involved in um, cannabidiol and exercise. So working with um, Chris Gaffney at the Lancaster Medical School. We've been trying to understand what it means to take cannabidiol or CBD, which is available as a nutritional substance in any store you like. CBD in drinks and bars and and oils or whatever are sold as a well-being product. But actually, do they really do that, particularly at the dose in which the Food Standards Authority has actually identified that they should be a daily dose of? That amount, is that actually enough to do anything? The reason why we chose exercise is that there is some use of CBD in sport. And so it's kind of, well, why? And is it a real effect? So does it help you to recover more quickly? And if so, then what are the mechanisms of that that we can try to unpick and understand? Because that's important for elite athletes to know as well. I think there is a future for many plant-derived products, actually, because we still don't really fully understand how many of them work. For example, going back to cocaine and other ones that are addictive is a lot of these things, 
impact on our reward pathways. But then is that something that we can utilize rather than it being considered a bad thing? Is that something that we can utilize? And is there um, a role that that could play in recovery, for example? So being able to understand how they work is really, really important. And there's some drugs that we use today uh, that we actually don't fully understand all the things that it does. For example, aspirin, we use it for pain relief, but there are loads of things that it does that we don't understand the mechanism of it. So I I think there's lots to unpick. And then potentially with that knowledge, we can move forward and find new medicines that can manipulate those pathways as well. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of 100 Years, 100 Objects. Don't forget to listen to our other episodes where we discuss everything from axes to astronomy.